some nations, some countries um, are saying it should be ignored because it is coming from a leader who is not necessarily sane and uh, that Iran, even with the nuclear weapons, will not dare to attack Israel because the consequences could be the, literally the destruction most of Iran, if not all of Iran, because Israel has the capacity and the weapons, uh, for that matter, to do just that. But for the Israelis, they cannot afford and they do not take these kind of threats lightly because, again, historical experiences speak very loud, loudly in this, in this uh, situation. Uh, Israel cannot afford um, to say, well, he's just a madman and uh, can be ignored, specifically when these pronouncements have been made many times, not just once, over many years. And as Iran pursued from the Israeli perspective a nuclear weapon program, that makes this kind of statements extremely dangerous from the Israeli perspective. I can suggest to you, had the Iranians did not make such statements over the years, had the Iranian maintained a semblance of not necessarily a real peaceful relation with Israel, but sort of maintained some kind of semblance of just kind of live and, you know, live and let live position, Israel might not have objected to Iran and nuclear program. Israel, for example, did not object and said nothing about Pakistan developing uh, a nuclear program because Pakistan never threatened Israel directly or indirectly. And in Pakistan is a Muslim state. And so there is a discernible here difference uh, that is these threats that coming so frequently from Iran precipitate and will continue to precipitate the kind of reaction from, from Israel that could eventually, you know, by default, lead to a confrontation or conflagration uh, of such magnitude that nobody really wants to see taking place. I think Iran, uh, after the revolution, have made a supreme effort to try to export its revolution to the rest of the Middle East, and it's been it's been so far uh, a dismal failure. When the Arab Spring, so to speak, erupted uh, you know, two years ago, the Iranians felt, well, this is, this is, that they have in many ways contributed to the awakening of the, of the Arab and the Muslim world. And that is really just not the case. As a matter of fact, you did not find a single Arab country today, be that Libya, Tunisia, Egypt, wants to follow the regime of the kind of regime that, Israel, that uh, Iran has today. So in that respect, I think it was a failure, and the Iranians recognized that. Nowadays, of course, is, uh, the situation is even worse. That is, Iran is under tremendous economic pressure as a result of the international sanctions that have been imposed on it. And the situation in Syria, which is uh, the, the linchpin, for Iran's ambition to become a regional hegemon is unraveling. The likelihood of uh, Bashar uh, Assad regime is extremely strong. In fact, it's inevitable. And so the Iranians do not know what kind of government will follow the Assad regime. And of course, they're trying to make, uh, they're making every effort to try to influence the outcome of the inevitable collapse of the Assad regime. So the Iranian probably, if you look at the, from the time of the revolution to this very day, the uh, Iran position in the region has deteriorated, albeit they, they remain hard at work in order to obtain uh, perhaps a nuclear weapons, in order to sort of to make up for the weakness, uh, weaknesses they have thus far demonstrated over the last 10-15 uh, years. Uh, so this is of course remain to be seen, but on the, on the whole I think Iran is much weaker, specifically well, you know, following the collapse of the Assad regime. And with that, of course, its influence in Lebanon will also be undermined severely. And that may begin to, may be the beginning of the end of its uh, desire to become a regional hegemon in, in a very effective way. That is, they still have the aspiration, but they will probably be, it will be unable to translate that uh, into real power. Uh, that it is uh, that would affect the region.